Hi, welcome to my studio. My name's Chris. In this video, I'm going to show you how I create this color wheel, swatching out all the colors on my palette. If you'd like to learn more about the colors that I currently use on my palette, stay tuned. Here we go. Over the years that I've been painting in watercolor, I have swatched out the colors on my palette many, many times, as you can see here. I don't always use the same colors. I have switched colors off of my palette, adding new colors to my palette. And every six months or so, I have swatched out the palette again. I do this so I have a really accurate record of the colors on my palette. So as I'm painting, I can refer to those. Recently, one of my subscribers asked if my most recent video showing my colors was the same colors I was using, and I had to admit, no, I've swatched, uh, I've switched some of those colors off and added new colors to my palette. So she asked, well, could you please do another video showing us your current colors on your palette? And I decided to do so. So that's the, the reason for this video. I want to show you real quickly the steps that I take to setting up my palette. Uh, first of all, I usually refer to the Quiller Wheel. I'm going to show you an example of that and where you can purchase it here. On the video, you can see the Quiller Wheel lays out the colors uh, with yellow at the top, all the warm colors on the left, and the, the um, with purple at the bottom, and then all the cooler colors over on the right. There are lots of ways to lay out a color wheel. This is one way. I like the Quiller system. And so I use that to generally place my colors on the wheel. Again, yellow at the top. Once I've decided how I'm going to lay it out, I take my porcelain palette. You know if you've watched any of my videos that I love porcelain palettes. This is the Quiller Porcelain Palette by Jack Richardson. Uh, this is a little bit expensive. There are others by Magello that are about half the price of this one. I love this one and I highly recommend it, but if this is a little expensive for you, consider buying one of the other brands. But um, if you can get a porcelain palette, I highly recommend it. Check out my video that talks about six reasons why I use porcelain palettes in my studio. I think that they are the best kind of palette to use for watercolor for a number of different reasons, so check out that video. Okay, so once you have laid out all the colors on your palette the way you want to, now it's time to swatch those colors onto watercolor paper. So the first thing you want to do is check out the link in the description below and find a link to this template that I've created. This template has 24 spots in a circle uh, representing the 24 spots on the uh, Quiller palette or on many of the other palettes that you can purchase out there. And you'll take this and transfer it to your watercolor paper. Here's that same template transferred over here to my watercolor paper. This is 140 pound Ba Hong cold pressed paper. That's what I usually paint on. So I recommend whatever paper you normally use to paint on that that's what you swatch your colors onto. In addition to the circle template with the 24 sections, I also, as you can see here, put the name of the color, the brand name, and the actual pigment numbers that are used to make that color. I highly recommend that you don't just learn the names of the colors, but you also understand what pigments are being used to create those colors. As you begin to understand how the colors are made and how they are being formulated, I think you have a lot better understanding of how these colors will mix and interact with each other as you put them on your paper. It's just good to learn as much as you can about the ingredients and the materials you're using. Okay, now that I have all this transferred to my paper, I'm going to switch to my other part of my studio here, and I'm going to swatch out all of the colors. There's 24 around the center, but then there's another 8 around the edge. That's where all my neutral colors and earth tones go, so it's a total of 32 colors. Here we go. Okay, as I usually do, I'm going to start here at the uh, top center, which is my yellow, my primary yellow. This is Hansa Yellow Light, PY3 by Daniel Smith. Next I have Cadmium Yellow. This is a Winsor Newton color. It's actually left over from an old set of my mom's. I don't actually have this color any longer, but I'm just using up what I have. Next comes Nickel Azo Yellow, a really uh, beautiful color, very vibrant. 
has a lot of granulation in it, which I like. If you've watched my other uh, videos, you've learned that I like several things. I like granulating, I like high transparency uh, or semi-transparent, uh, and I like single pigment colors whenever possible. Uh, I think I forgot to mention the pigments in cadmium yellow. This is PY35 and PO20. And here in nickel azyl yellow, a Daniel Smith color, I have PY150. Now I'm moving around the circle to my warmer yellows. This is really almost an orange yellow. And this is New Gamboge by Daniel Smith. New Gamboge uh, is PY97 and PY110. Just so you know, I will be putting the names and the uh, pigment numbers there on the screen, as you can see, for each of these. In addition to that, you can find a link to every single one of these colors in the video description below with a link to where I purchased it, so you can learn more about that color. Now I'm doing transparent pyrrole orange, a Daniel Smith color. This is my true secondary orange color. Transparent pyrrole orange is PO71. Now, because I love my earth tone colors and I don't have enough room for them around the outside, I have to put my raw sienna here inside uh, the circle. And this is raw sienna by Daniel Smith, PBR7. I do a lot of landscape painting, and so having lots of earth tone colors and good neutrals and colors that mix well to produce accurate um, landscape colors uh, raw sienna is an essential color on my palette. Next, I have an unusual color on my palette, uh, naphthamide maroon, Daniel Smith, PR171. It's a maroon color, as you can see here. And I guess a convenience color. It's something you could mix from other, from a blue and a red. But I just really love the rich wine color of this. And um, I love it, so I put it here amongst the reds. My next color, which would be uh, my warmest red, uh, kind of a, a very brilliant red, is Pyrrole Red by M. Graham. This is PR254. Some people might call that a fire engine red. A, it's very warm, closer towards the orange and yellows. Now we're going to move into the reds um, that are cooler. This is Permanent Alizarin Crimson. This is in my primary red position. Permanent alizarin crimson is PR264, and this is an M. Graham color. Now even more cool, or towards the blues, is my quinacridone rose. Quinacridone rose is a Daniel Smith color, PB19. Quinacridone lilac is next, and this is also a Daniel Smith color. And uh, I don't, as you can tell, I used to have a opera on my palette, a pink color, but I got rid of it because it's so fugitive. And I can use this quin lilac, quinacridone lilac, instead of opera or instead of a pink color if I need it. This is Daniel Smith PR122. Next, I have uh, Ultramarine Violet by Daniel Smith. This is PV15. It's a very transparent purple color. Next, a very heavily pigmented and Brilliant purple is Dioxazone Purple by M. Graham, PV23. Because it's so heavily pigmented, it is difficult to get it to really, uh, you need to add a lot of water here to get it to be more transparent looking. Next is a color that's quickly becoming a real favorite for, for me is Lavender by Daniel Smith. This actually has white in it, titanium white, and so it can be more trans, uh, sorry, more opaque because of that. It's wonderful for mixing with other colors in landscapes to create shadows, and I just love it. It's got three pigments in it, PW6, PV15, and PB29. If you want to learn more about that color and why I love it so much, check out my other video on my channel about Lavender by Daniel Smith. Now a color I use in almost every painting, French Ultramarine. This is a uh, warmer blue amongst the blues and it is on many artists' palette. It's such a common color. I choose French ultramarine over regular ultramarine blue. I just like the way it um, has a little bit warmer color to it. I love the granulation. And this is, again, Daniel Smith, PB29. Now another very common blue, little bit cooler blue, 
and uh, on most uh, artist palette is cobalt blue. I probably could have moved this over into the primary blue spot here where you see the P because it would probably be considered the primary or middle of the road blue by many artists and I have it not right there but right next to it. Uh, cobalt blue PB28 by Daniel Smith. Beautiful color. Again I use this in almost every painting. And my next blue that I use in almost every painting, Cerulean Blue Chromium by Daniel Smith. They have a Cerulean Blue as well, but I like the Cerulean Blue Chromium better. I feel it's a little bit more heavily pigmented, and uh, I really love it. It's granulating, single pigment, uh, PB36. That's Daniel Smith, Cerulean Blue Chromium. Those three blues that I just mentioned, French Ultramarine, Cobalt Blue, and Cerulean Blue Chromium, I use in almost every painting that I do. Now this is a convenience color. I love it. Cobalt Teal Blue PG50, PG5050 by Daniel Smith. And uh, convenience color because it's difficult to mix this color from other colors on the palette potentially and so just having it there ready to use is wonderful. Cobalt Teal Blue. Now I'm entering into the green area of my palette. Honestly, I don't use very many of these pre-mixed greens hardly at all except for one of them maybe two. Uh, I just have them on my palette, kind of left over from <laughs> the early days of trying to figure out what colors I wanted on my palette. And this is one of them I hardly ever use, Thalo Turquoise by Daniel Smith. Another Thalo color is Thalo Green. This is M. Graham, PG7. And um, I think I've just gotten away from using hardly any Thalo colors. Uh, from what I understand, they're highly staining colors typically and I have gotten away from using staining colors for the most part. Here's another green, Cascade Green. I think I kind of went on a green rampage for a while and bought a bunch of different greens and I had heard of this one specially colored by uh, Daniel Smith, Cascade Green. It's PBR7 and PB15. Again, I hardly ever use it. Now this next color is Sap Green by M. Graham. If I was just going to reach for a green that I, where I just really quickly wanted to get a, a green on my paper and without mixing I would, might use this sap green um, but again I mix almost all my greens just using my Hansa yellow and a blue or my nickel azo yellow and another like French ultramarine or something like that. I don't really use greens out of the tube that much. Even if I do use the sap green I usually will mix it with either more yellow or with uh, even a, a brown or something and kind of mute it a little bit more and so I don't use it that much but uh, sap green is a good one to have on your palette if you're going to have a green. This is sap green by M. Graham. It's PG7 PY110. Now this last color around the center circle and the last green is green gold by uh, Daniel Smith. That's just actually one of the greens that I actually like. I just find it's a, a beautiful color and I love how it comes down into almost a yellow, uh, goldish yellow, and it's a beautiful green. It's granulating. It has three pigments though, PY150, PY3, and PG36, but I just think it's a beautiful color, and I keep this one on my palette all the time and use it a fair bit. Okay, so that's all 23 colors. You can see I have the one open spot that I haven't filled. That's my colors around the center circle. Uh, again, yellow at the top, all my warms on the left, my blues more on the right and bottom. Um, now let's go around and do the other colors that are in these other eight spots. These are my earth tones and my neutrals. And uh, I'll start up here in the upper left. This is quinacridone gold. I love the quinacridone gold. It's just beautiful granulating. I love the way it separates out into orange and these gold yellow colors. And this is Daniel Smith. It's a PO48 and PY150. Now instead of using yellow ochre like many people use on their palette, I choose to use Transparent Yellow Oxide by Daniel Smith. It uh, is a little bit more heavily pigmented, vibrant, uh, but yet still transparent. And uh, it's just a, a good substitute for yellow ochre. I don't like the yellow ochre in the Daniel Smith line, so this is a nice substitute for that. That was Transparent Yellow Oxide PY42. Okay, now down to the lower left. This is my Burnt Sienna. Um, I used to have a different color here, but switched this out for this M. Graham Burnt Sienna. As you can tell, I'm mostly using Daniel Smith colors, but I do have some M. Graham 
on my palette still. I pretty much switched all the new colors I purchased are pretty much Daniel Smith, but I have other colors in my studio here and I just use them up and then purchase something else if I run out. I've been happy with this M. Graham Burnt Sienna. That's PBR7. Next I have uh, Daniel Smith Payne's Gray. I tend to use this primarily for my value studies. I do value studies very often uh, before I paint a landscape. And um, so I use Payne's Gray for that. This is PB29 and PBK9. And just a wonderful, beautiful, neutral gray color. Next is Indigo by Daniel Smith. And uh, this has much, got much more blue in it than Payne's Gray. And so it's a blue gray, um, but beautiful to mix in with other colors to darken them. And this is PB60 and uh, PBK6, Indigo by Daniel Smith. This next color is a very versatile color called Neutral Tint. I have another video about it. I encourage you to go watch that to see why I use this. Uh, this looks similar to Payne's Gray, but it is a little more neutral. Um, it is considered one of the most neutral colors on the palette. can be very conveniently mixed with many other colors to darken them or neutralize them and to make them, uh, yeah, to use them in your uh, landscapes and things like that. I just love it. I use it all the time. Again, watch my video if you want to know my reasons for using it and see me swatch it against all my other colors on the palette. It's PBK6, PB19, and PB15 Neutral Tint by Daniel Smith. Coming back around to the top now, this is my Burnt Umber by Daniel Smith. Really a color I think has to be on every palette. Beautiful, dark, rich brown, and mixes beautifully with things like blue to create gray neutrals. Um, and uh, just really, I use a lot in my landscapes. Burnt Umber by Daniel Smith, that's PBR7. And finally, my last color I'm going to swatch out here. This is Red Brown, a Magello color, one of the few Magello colors I still have on my palette. I hardly ever use this color. In fact, when I do reach for it and put it on my <laughs> paintings, I often i am like, yeah, I don't really like that color. Very reddish brown, obviously the, the name of the color is Red Brown. PBR 25 is the pigment. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's almost like a uh, burnt sienna and it could find its place on your palette, but I just don't tend to use it that much. Uh, I guess because I have other, like a burnt sienna already, but that's Red Brown by Magello, PBR 25. So there you have it. If you're interested in knowing what's currently on my palette, these are all the colors swatched out. I will go ahead and scan this once it's dry and upload this along uh, with a link along with the rest of the video description so that you could download it and take a look and read some of these words in here. I realize they're a little small. You can also check out the links in the description below to see more about each of these colors. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Keep on painting.